morning, everyone. Good morning. How feels everyone? Awake and ready. All right. That's a lot of awake and ready. <laughs> Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father Divine, Mother, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Friend, Beloved God Great, Masters, Great Masters, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ Babaji Krishna, Babaji Krishna Lahiri, Mahashaya, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Swami Yukteswar Beloved, Guru, Beloved Guru, Paramahansa Yoganandaji, Saints and sages of all religions, Saints and sages of all religions. We, humbly bow to you all. we humbly bow to you all. Bless us, Bless us. With, thy with thy grace, with thy guidance. With thy guidance. Let, thy love and joy Let thy love and joy form a bubble around us, form a bubble around us. enlightening us. Enlightening Protecting us, protecting us and helping us to share thy light with everyone we meet. Oh, oh, peace. peace. Amen. Amen. When the dawn breaks and then the morning sends the sun high in the sky, who would hide from heaven's glory? Pass the challenge by. La 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 la
the work the whole week worthwhile just to <laughs> see and hear that my goodness that was wonderful well we want to again thank by thank all of you for coming and welcome you here please know that this is your home if there's absolutely anything that you need or anything that anyone can do for you please let us know and we welcomed many, many groups last night, but we want to welcome now several others. Uh, those who are joining us online, they're just starting today to do live streaming broadcasts. So welcome to all of you. And a few special welcomes to, not everyone knows these people, but bear with us. They are part of your family, whether you know them or not. Willie, Keith, and Suzanne, who are watching from his hospital room. <laughs> Willie was instrumental in creating this building, and on the last day of painting, he fell off a scaffolding here, and he's recovering nicely, but he's in the hospital now. And but coming along very nicely. So Willie, we also want to uh, acknowledge our dear friend Jai Ram, who is always with us in our hearts, wherever we are, wherever you are, you are with us. And then we also want to extend Warm wishes to and from Narayani and Shurjo in Mumbai, who could not come, unfortunately, but they said, please give everyone their love and their greetings. <laughs> and finally, we want, I, I can't spot everyone, but if you were part of the building crew who created, in any capacity, this temple, please stand up. These great souls, especially over the last two or three months, have worked heroically and many, many, many long days and long hours. As most of you know, we mentioned it last night, we received approval for this building only on Friday, so <laughs> three days ago. Otherwise, we'd be sitting out there somewhere. <laughs> and. It was due to the hard work and long, long hours of many of these builders. It was also due to the countless hours of volunteer energy. Many hands really did make this miracle. If you were part of a volunteer crew that helped build this or clean it or landscape it, please stand up.
And this is for all of you. So this is as close to you get as a blessing from a county official. <laughs> so this is from the head of, the, we live in a Nevada county, that's the district we are. So the head of Ananda County Building Department, when they gave us their, <laughs> what? Oh, excuse me. <laughs> That will come, yes, that will come. come. <laughs> okay, so the head of Nevada County Building Department, and this was when he gave the final approval, he wrote this note, and Atman sent it out, and I just thought it's too good not to share. So he writes, thank you for having us out today for your final inspection. The final product turned out great and your community will be able to enjoy it for many years to come. I really do mean it when I said that it is some of the best work I've seen in a while and some of the most complex components met all the minimum code requirements from the first installation. Trust me when I say this is rarely the case with many of our projects. <laughs> So I want to give you just a very brief overview of the flow of the classes for the week. This morning, Davy and I will talk about the mission of the masters that created the vision that we're all following. Tomorrow, uh, a panel of uh, Nayaswami Asha, uh, Jaya and Shivani. Jaya and Shivani will talk about manifest, taking that vision and manifesting it in this physical plane. I won't mention all the panelists because I'll forget them. <laughs> <laughs> but on, on Wednesday, a panel will talk about spreading this mission around the world. On Thursday, we'll have uh, many speakers quite a few of them from the new wave generation, as we call them, who will talk about the many various manifestations of this. And then on Friday, a group of us will speak about the particular role that Swami and Ananda play in, wor in raising world consciousness. On Saturday will be the grand dedication and we will have representatives from many, many different religions. Uh, all of the religions that you see represented in the symbols around the, um, around the sides of this beautiful temple. And so that gives you an overview of the flow of the week. And then we'll have the closing Sunday. The, the first Sunday service in this temple will be on Sunday. And so to begin our presentation, we want to share with you a wonderful video that uh, you can see on the screens that our wonderful crew has put together. This, this is from on, typically on the 4th of July for the last, or that weekend for the last many years. We've had some of the people who were involved in the early years of the community come and share their experiences so that we capture uh, an oral and visual history of this community. We've done that for a number of years now. These are largely excerpts from that. And finally, we want to share with you today something quite remarkable. All those notebooks that you see over there, this is the first English Braille edition of Autobiography of the Yogi. This was spearheaded by Sangeeta in Delhi, who heads up our publications department. And she is the mother of Gorov, please stand. And uh, Go Gorja, Go is Gorja? So 
She sent her beautiful children to serve Ananda. She's not able to travel too well. But anyway, this, as you can see, there are uh, uh, four, seven, eight volumes of this. But it's the first time ever that this is available for English speakers in Braille. The inside looks quite a bit different from what you're used to. <laughs> And it also feels very different <laughs> from what you're used to. Okay, so let's start the picture. I met him in 1966, and I knocked on his door, uh, introduced ourselves, he introduced himself, and said, I'm working on a project, would you like to help? I said yes, not realizing that I'm still working on that project. <laughs> Around 1967, he also acquired the land, which is the meditation retreat. I went off by myself to feel the land. The impression came to me strongly that the particular portion I was walking had been blessed already by our gurus. It had an eastern exposure, especially attractive to me as a yogi. There were no buildings, and it was completely raw land, you know, no clearing of the brush and none of the beautiful landscaping that we have now. But we would come up and work on the weekends. And through that winter was the period in which we built three different geodesic domes trying to build a temple there. And all of them ended in disaster. So the first one collapsed. The second one was up for a little while, and it was beautiful. I think the wind picked that one up and <laughs> just moved it across the countryside. <laughs> Many of the first structures at Ananda were domes, and they were done that way because of the spiritual effect of that rounded shape. Rounded ceilings, which correspond to the shape of the head, seemed to reflect energy back harmoniously. I remembered how often Yogananda quoted the suggestion made to him by an architect, immortalize your teachings in architecture. We built Swamiji's dome, we built a, a temple, we built a dining hall, but it was a, a contractor who was doing that work, uh, so it didn't all splinter again. And so he came up and secluded here uh, at the meditation retreat. And during, for two or three weeks during that time, he wrote the book, Cooperative Communities, How to Start Them and Why. It became the Bible of the cooperative communities movement at that time. We just did everything. We published some books. We printed them. Seva helped, and I would try to take them around to bookstores and sell them. And, teaching classes at night and corresponding and so on. Uh, it was very, very active, very busy, you know, six to ten every day. Night has flown, dawn has come. Wake my children, wake. Wake my children, wake. Sitting in the asana of meditation, Sitting in the asana of meditation, think ye of your gurus, Lord. Swami kept up this incredible pace. He had just enormous energy and will in the early years. It was that that produced Ananda. Swami was having retreats. Uh, there was a small staff. We were cooking. We were hosting uh, guests who would come up and so on. Oh God, beautiful, oh God, beautiful, oh God, beautiful, oh God, beautiful. At thy feet, oh, I do bow. At thy feet, oh, I do bow. Oh God, beautiful, oh God, beautiful. Oh God, beautiful, oh God, beautiful. In the forest thou art free. In the forest, thou art free. In the mountains, thou 
there was a core of people who were more and more, as the time went by, more and more committed to this way of life and this project. I remember I, I, the new kid on the block. I came in July 1969, 4th of July. I had my backpack, my sleeping bag, a little suitcase. And by the end of the summer, we had an opportunity to test our commitment. There was no place to live. Everyone had been camping out all this time. And so we thought, why not try teepees? So we, we kind of got together and we thought, let's make this a group project. After the poles were cut, then we stripped the bark. And then after that, I sewed 12 of them. <laughs> I don't know how many more I made, but it was a lot. <laughs> One of the disadvantages of teepees were that they were open at the top and it was raining, and it rains a lot here during the winter time. That winter, it rained 14 days straight. And as I was in there, my space <laughs> and so as we progressed along this magnificent engineering pathway, we actually had wood stoves inside the teepee. We were able to make it somewhat more comfortably, albeit considerably more dangerously, through the winter. <laughs> One day also, I left the fire for, for a while. I just turned around and I turned back and the whole teepee was... Oh. Yeah, but I, I put it out. I put it out <laughs> in time, but uh, it was uh, it. There was a very uh, steep learning curve. We call those learning experiences. <laughs> Animals were a constant uh, for many of the teepees. Usually, it was the raccoons and who would take up residence underneath. We'd make little uh, wooden platforms inside to get off the ground, and so the, of course the raccoons would like to go underneath. I had many things that came in my teeth. Yeah, I had uh, raccoons that would fight inside of it, and they would take my food and open up to the... That first winter was, I don't know, I, I should really look at the weather records, <laughs> but, but my impression was it was a hard winter. <laughs> I mean, the snow was quite deep. <laughs> what was most important was that here we had been this group of people who just didn't know, have a clue of how to work together. And we had done it. We had worked as a team and we had such a good time. We learned that that's what makes community. The idea of working in harmony, a real sense of community, of bonding, making new friends, having a, a greater vision than your own little likes and dislikes and desires, something expansive. I felt this energy, something is going to happen here. And I don't know what it is, but it's going to help many, many people. Behind it all, there was something so profound. And it's the spirit of God and Guru that has created Ananda. July 31st, 1949. Master delivers his talk about World Brotherhood communities in Beverly Hills. He started in talking powerfully about communities. And he said, youth must go north, south, east, west, everywhere to spread this ideal of cooperative communities, World Brotherhood communities. And he said, I am sowing my thoughts in the ether and my words shall not die. He was never invited back. It was a powerful talk, the most powerful talk I've ever heard. And I at least vowed that I would do what I could to make that a reality. That was 20 years before Ananda started. That's all it was, 20 years. That's when it all started. And I could see, not see, I could feel what this would be. Just the vision of it, the reality, how tangible it was, and that there was going to grow here a very important thing, and that I could be a part of creating a new life, a new way of life. Building something new, just, just the new life, the new world, the new society. And that, to me, was everything. And I felt that I would stay here for the rest of my life, and that I would sacrifice 
anything to be here and to be part of this because possibly it could be the most important thing that was happening on earth, at least for me. That's what Ananda is. It's not the buildings and the finances and any of it. It's that interchange between the individual soul and God. Its spark goes out and people see that spark and they say this place is filled with light. And for those of you who are coming now when you're in your 20s, please understand it's just beginning. And we are all so blessed to be a part of it. Isn't that fun? And there'll be another one tomorrow. So just as an enticement to get you here. <laughs> so the essence of Ananda, the mission of Ananda, started long, long ago, way before any of us were manifested on the plane. And ultimately, it boils down to one thing, and that's for each to create an environment and a teaching and a knowledge that allows each of us to pursue the quest for God in the best, most efficient possible way for us. And so Ananda, this temple as an expression of it, is a very much a divine work, a divine manifestation. And it started really impersonally, one might say, although God is both personal and impersonal, he's vastly impersonal, but he also needs to express himself personally. So it turns out that the planet that we're on goes through ages, goes through yugas, as Sri Yukteswar explained. And in that process of going through the changes of four different yugas, Kali, Dwapara, Treta, and Satya Yuga, as the changing points of those yugas come, really because the succeeding many, many years, hundreds of years, in or thousands of years, are going to have a particular vibration to them. A new teaching needs to be done in such a way, I'm setting a timer here so I, <laughs> so I know to stop in time. A new teaching needs to be given to mankind that is appropriate for that age. And so around 1700, there was a changeover from Kali Yuga, the age of materialism and separation, to Dwapara Yuga, the age of energy. And it's also the age of integration, where the nations of the earth, the languages, the peoples will begin to come together more. If you want to use an image, think of Kali Yuga as a tray of ice and you can cut that ice into blocks, into cubes, and you can keep them all separated, and they don't move around on you. And you can, if, if you're a big block of ice, you can try to smash a smaller block of ice, and, but you have to do it to one that's close to you. So the world at that time in Kali Yuga was very, very much more separated and very much more committed to the thought that this physical plane is the only ultimate reality. In the changeover to Dwapara Yuga, it now becomes the age of energy. And in the age of energy, each of these ages has, a, one might think of it as a raising of the vibration or a raising of the temperature. And when you raise the temperature of that block, of that tray of ice, those cubes begin to melt. And right now we're in the melting process. There are still some old Kali Yuga cubes floating around, making a lot of noise. 
because they clash up against each other. But there's also a lot of water that is mingling together. It's much harder to keep that water separated and ultimately we don't want to. So our masters incarnated at the beginning of this age in order to give us the way to live and most importantly, the way to worship or to seek God during this, uh, this age. I want to read a couple of quotes from the autobiography of a yogi because ultimately what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to build a link between the beginning of Dwapara Yuga and all of us sitting in this temple today. And so here's what uh, Babaji uh, said uh, in, at the Kumbha Mela. Our master said, quoting Babaji, Babaji is in constant communication with Christ. Together they send out vibrations of redemption and have planned the spiritual technique of salvation for this age. The work of these two fully illumined masters, one with the body, the one without it, is to inspire the nations to forsake suicidal wars, race hatreds, religious sectarianism, and boomerang evils of materialism. So he's named the obvious uh, difficulties that were the milieu in which we're all living. Our line is to uh, inspire us to forsake those things. Babaji is well aware of the trend of modern times, especially of the influence and complexities of Western civilization, and realizes the necessity of spreading the self-liberating liberations of yoga equal, equally in the West and in the East. So Babaji, being the head of our lineage, and Christ are sending out these rays to help change world consciousness. And that change of world consciousness is ultimately for people's well-being and for their happiness. And even though people may only vaguely relate to the teachings, only vaguely understand that there is a new energy. Nonetheless, they feel it. Nonetheless, their souls respond because ultimately we're all completely united at the soul level. So Babaji has represented, it isn't our lineage alone. There are many lineages also that are helping with this transition. But our lineage in particular has some particular missions that it's trying to accomplish. And so Babaji is sending out these rays of energy and every succeeding link has come for a particular purpose. So Babaji's great disciple was Lahiri Mahashaya. Lahiri Mahashaya's particular purpose was to receive and then begin the spread of Kriya Yoga throughout the world. Now this didn't happen by chance. In the biography of, uh, from the uh, writings, from the journals of, of Lahiri Mahashaya, it says that Lahiri Mahashaya was very well aware of and concerned about the pace of life that was coming into the world in Dwapara, Dwapara Yuga. In Kali Yuga, it was a slower, um, more, one can't say relaxed, more tamasic, but, but uh, a slower pace of life. As we all know, as we all face, as we all are struggling with, the pace of life is very, very fast now. So Lahiri, being a great avatar already, knew that this planet needed a different kind of a teaching, that men and women would not have the kind of time available to spend hours daily on their sadhana. And so he, of course, the science of Kriya Yoga has been known for, for, from ancient, ancient times. Master said that 
if you begin the path of yoga, you will end up with Kriya Yoga. Because even the practice, he said, of the energization, if you begin the practice of the energization, it will ultimately lead you to the discovery of Kriya Yoga. Because Kriya is central to the way that we are built as, as human beings. It's central to our nervous system. And so Kriya Yoga is the particular teaching that will allow the progression of consciousness, the upliftment of individual consciousness in the most efficient way. How efficient? Well, Master said that a single Kriya is worth a year of living. And so we, as Kriya bonds, end up living two or three incarnations every day simply through our practice of Kriya. Now that's efficiency. So, <laughs> so, this, so Lahiri incarnated in order to bring the, the, the spread of Kriya Yoga into the mindset of the world and give this sacred technique. And it was extremely important in the autobiography, it's recounted that when Lahiri met Babaji at the Kumbha Mela, uh, no, met Babaji, not at the Kumbha Mela, that's Sri Yukteswar, met Babaji when he brought him up to uh, what's now the near Ranikat, um, in the near, at Babaji's cave, you remember in the autobiography of a yogi, um, that Lahiri, after he was told that he needed to go back and to give Kriya Yoga to those who were qualified, highly qualified, he said, asked Babaji, can I not also give it to those sincere men and women who are not highly qualified, but who are sincerely seeking God so that they can become highly qualified? And Babaji said, God has spoken through you, let it be so. And so that changed from the time, as Master put it, of priestly secrecy and man's indifference, where Kriya Yoga was a hidden science. It brought it out into the public. And so then the next step in this link is that uh, Sri Yukteswar, the disciple of Ma of uh, Lahiri Mahashaya meets Babaji at the Kumbha Mela. And if you remember from the autobiography of a yogi, Sri Yukteswar had a little bit of a critical thought in his mind that all these people running around, the scientists of the West are doing much more good for the world than these people kind of uh, worshiping in a sort of a superstitious manner. Babaji caught that thought and called him to him. And then Babaji said to, to, to Sri Yukteswar, and this is again a quote from the autobiography, East and West must establish a golden middle path of activity and spirituality combined. He continued, India has much to learn from the West in material development. In return, India can teach the universal methods by which West will be able to base its religious beliefs on the unshakable foundations of yogic science. You, Swamiji, have a part to play in the coming harmonious exchange between Orient and Occident. Some years hence, I shall send to you a disciple whom you can train for yoga dissemination in the West. The vibrations there of many spiritually seeking souls come flood-like to me. I perceive potential saints in America and Europe waiting to be awakened. I'm gonna read that last line again because he's talking to all of us. The vibrations of many spiritually seeking souls come flood-like to me. I perceive potential saints in America and Europe waiting to be reawakened. So we all of us, I'm sure that you feel it. We all feel it. We're yearning to be awakened from 
the dilemmas and from the miasma that Maya has hypnotized us to believe. And so it's the call of our heart that has drawn this particular lineage to come to us personally. Without that draw, there are millions and millions of people in the West. And massive though this crowd is for this temple, compared to the billions of people in the world, it's still tiny. But we're here because our hearts are yearning and we're in tune with that vibration. So Master obviously was trained and sent to the West. And I won't recount that because we all probably know the story from the autobiography of a yogi. But Master came to the West with some very special particular missions. And I'm going to read the aims and ideals of Master from the early times. This is before Swami came. These are the aims and ideals. And as you will also project them so that you can, if you have a little difficulty with English, you can read them more easily. But as I read these, think of how many of these are the central core missions also of Ananda. As I went down this list, it was check off, yes, this one, yes, this one, yes, this one. So here they are. To disseminate among the nations a knowledge of definite scientific techniques for attaining direct personal experience of God. And so that's largely what we're doing, what we're doing sitting here today. To prove the practical truth in the immortal teachings of Jesus Christ and the self-realized masters of India. That practical truth is more than just theoretical worship. That's the uh, very, very important changeover at this time. To point out the one highway to God by which all pa bypaths of religions meet. The highway of daily scientific meditation to attain divine communion. To heal and liberate man from his threefold sufferings, physical disease, mental inharmonies, and spiritual ignorance. To attain threefold perfection of development, body, mind, and soul. To demonstrate the superiority of mind over body, of soul over mind. To further the, science, the spiritual and cultural understanding between East and West and to promote an exchange of the finest distinctive features. To harmonize science and religion through study and practical realization of the unity of their underlying principles. To spread a spirit of brotherhood among all peoples and to aid in establishing in many countries self-sustaining world brotherhood colonies for plain living and high thinking. <coughs> to overcome evil by good, sorrow by joy, cruelty by kindness, ignorance by wisdom. And finally, to serve mankind as one's larger self. So those are very succinctly why this lineage, this great line of masters have incarnated at this particular time. So Master, when he came, he went around this country, as you know, on his spiritual campaigns, and he spoke rousingly to hundreds of thousands of people. We might think that he only went and just gave those big lectures, but in fact, he would go in the early years, city by city, and he would stay a month or six weeks, and he would give not only the lectures to thousands, but he would give classes, the same kind of classes that Ananda is still giving today. He would give the same, uh, what we call the path to Kriya Yoga, the teachings of meditation of Hong Sa, of uh, Om technique and, and preparation for Kriya. He, it's estimated that he initiated 100,000 people in Kriya Yoga. But 
how many of those really were able to take on a life. It was still very early in this process. Nonetheless, Master magnetized the whole changeover of religion. Things that he did were quite remarkable. The fact that he gave large, large classes like that, that wasn't really happening yet. The fact that he integrated the East and the West, the yogic teachings, and in certain cases, forms of Christianity that were uh, familiar to people in the West so that they could absorb them more easily, like Sunday services. It isn't necessarily typical in India that there be a Sunday service. But Master, knowing that that was the way that people would open themselves, began to do that. And there are many, many other things like that. But he was mixing the high, high ideals of the yogic teachings of millennia. See, India is the guru of the world and has always been. But now is the time that those great teachings be brought out to the public and spread all around the world. So Master began that and then Swamiji, he, one can't say he culminated his mission, but certainly the biggest single vehicle for the spread of this consciousness was the autobiography of a yogi. When that was published, it began a wave that went out around the world and is still going out around the world and has changed the lives of literally millions of people. One of those, of course, being Swamiji. When he read that book in New York, his, his soul obviously was already yearning for God. Now, just as the masters are avatars and they have come again and again and again at these changes of times. They were there at the change of time of Dwapar Yuga going into Kali Yuga because that was the time of the Bhagavad Gita, of the war at Kurukshetra, of Babaji and Arjuna, of, uh, of Krishna and Arjuna, Babaji and Master, and others of our lineage were there at that time. So at these times of great changes, especially they come. Well, Swami too was, has been for a long time part of that grouping. And so <clears throat> when he read the autobiography of a yogi, his soul was searching and searching for the proper connection that would fit his consciousness and awaken it. And when he read the autobiography of a yogi, it was as if a bomb went off in his consciousness and, and he found what he was looking for. And as you all know, within three or four days, he was on a bus traveling across America in order to come from New York to California to meet Yogananda. We're going to see tomorrow night the movie, The Answer, that depicts that so beautifully. But during that bus trip, he said he had two thoughts in particular, that I want to find God and I want to share God with everyone. Now, does that sound like it might be in tune with the aims and ideals? that I read. See, he, he had not never read these aims and ideals, or I don't think he had. But nonetheless, that was where his consciousness was, to find God and to share God with everyone. And so, as he began his work, which is, you know, he was with SRF for 10 years and then um, was ejected and then began the, really the mission for which he had been born, which was the founding not just of Ananda, but to put out the uh, next step of the lineage 
of these great masters. As we heard last night in that video, Master said to others, if only Walter had come earlier, we could have reached millions. So if this is all a divine play, why didn't Master, why didn't Walter come earlier? Well, because if he'd come earlier, then it wouldn't have been the timing yet for this to go viral, as we would say, at, at this point. So he had to come at the end of Master's life in order to be able to continue this spreading of the knowledge of knowing God and the spreading of finding God throughout the world. And so he came at perfectly timed timing. The divine knows these things, you know. So his timing was perfectly timed to come at a time and begin his mission at a time when man's indifference, remember why Korea was secret? Man's indifference, when man's indifference began to dissolve. And the age of the 60s when he started was a huge, in the West, a huge opening of consciousness where hundreds of thousands of young people were no longer indifferent to higher consciousness. They were yearning for it. So Swami came just at that right time to begin to spread these teachings that we now have and practice. And as we saw, as we will see, his incredible dynamism. When he took on, Master told him that he should write and he should edit and he should give, that he should teach. He took on that like a superhero, wrote 150 books, gave thousands of lectures and edited endlessly. We would rarely visit him at his house when he didn't have his clipboard there and was editing. And so that his life was a constant expression of what Master empowered him and gave him the responsibility to do. In addition, he took on the specific mission of the World Brotherhood Colonies, as no one else has. And so that enormous output of Swami, of his teachings, of his writings, of his songs, of cooperative communities, that's what has touched and brought each of us into this room today. So we are number six in that linkage, in that lineage, Babaji, Lahiri, Sri Yukteswar, Master, Swami, and now all of us sitting in this room today, and thousands and thousands more that are just like us, yearning for God and wanting to share what we have with others. And because of that, this work will go on and it will spread around the world and it will touch more and more people. It's already touching millions of people. Ananda's websites and other ways that we serve, it's that, that spread of the teachings has to be adapted to the forms and to the uh, potential methods that are available in any age. And so right now we're using not only written words in books, and other publishing, but television, movies, internet, apps. There's just been released a new Ananda app, which you can get on your phone. Means that whenever you travel around, you can look and see, oh, normally I'm in Delhi, but this week I'm in LA. I wonder what's happening in LA at Ananda. And you can get the whole schedule for Ananda LA, but that's just a, a, the form is going to keep changing and all of us are going to be just seeds that are planted that will grow into a tree and yield like, like the oaks that surround us. All of those oaks started as a tiny little acorn and they grew up and 
they've produced thousands and thousands more of that. And that nourished the animals, the Indian population, the American Indians that used to live here, Native Americans. And it's, it's the symbol of the nourishment and the spread of these teachings that all of us are those little acorns now. Or maybe some of us are little saplings. <laughs> but we have to get planted all around the world to produce more and more of this consciousness of change that is God's plan for this age. And so the fact that you're sitting in this room today is not by coincidence or by chance. You are here because you are part of God's plan to help you become enlightened and help share that with millions and millions. So good morning, again. <laughs> it's hard to talk because it's just so much fun looking at all of you. <laughs> but we will. So 50 years of manifesting the vision of the masters. Jyotish has been speaking about what is the mission of the masters. And if, to summarize what he said at the very end, twofold for the individual soul to find God and for the souls to come together and create communities to demonstrate more powerfully the inherent value of the spiritual life. But that, that's the what of the vision. But I'd like to talk about how. How did we do it for 50 years? And I'd like to talk about different attitudes and approaches that enabled this to exist, to flourish, to, uh, for, to grow for these 50 years so that we can celebrate it today in this beautiful new temple. First of all, the first quality or attribute of the how is to receive the vision. As Jyotish has been saying, the masters, the, the lineage, they trans, uh, get, transferred it from one to the other. But then we all came. And, I, and Swamiji was imbued with it from master. Uh, yesterday at the beautiful Sunday service talk that Bharat gave, he quoted from autobiography of a yogi, quoting Sri Teshwar saying to master, on the uh, eve of his departure in 1920 for the West. And he said, the spiritual light emanating from your eyes will change the consciousness of everyone you meet and make them more God conscious. And so that emanation of his consciousness to Swamiji, it happened, and we, as we know so beautifully, but then we all came. When I came, I was partway through autobiography of a yogi. I was interested in meditation and yoga, but that was about it. But then all of a sudden, this vision that Swami subtly and directly transferred, you can find God. You should spend your life seeking God. And I thought, really? I didn't know that. <laughs> You should build World Brotherhood communities. I, that was not in my plan of my life, but that vi we received his vision. It was transferred to us by osmosis, not whipping it into us or making us do anything, but he just the vibration. We received that twofold mission. I will spend my life seeking God. And I will do, as Shivani said so beautifully, I will do everything I can and sacrifice everything I have and know 
to help further this mission of building World Brotherhood communities. So we received the vision. That was the first step. The second step is to accept and do the tapasya, the sacrifice. And as we know, Master started. When he came to the West, we say, oh, look, here's a crowd. He was lecturing to a 1,000 people in Washington, DC. Well, you don't see him living in a little humble room in a seedy hotel in Boston. But that's how he started out, with no one, no one that he knew was there. But, and he w wrote in a letter to Dr. Lewis, I have to go to these men's clubs and give talks, and everyone's smoking, and I come home and my hair just smells like cigarette smoke. It's so hard for me. But the tapasya, he did the tapasya, he accepted it, and he did it. And then Swamiji, too, he knew that he had to give it everything he, can, he could. And he rode and he traveled. In those early days, it was hard to keep him in a line of sight because he was moving so quickly. Now I have to lecture in San Francisco, now Palo Alto, now Sacramento. Up and down the West Coast he went. And then when he wasn't traveling, he'd write. The tapasya, accepting it. But he, by watching him, we got it. We said, wow, this is what it takes. And we began, his tapasya became our tapasya. And we lived in teepees in the snow. And we uh, burned down our teepees inadvertently. And uh, whatever it took, we went out and we started communities. I know when Swamiji sent Tratish and me and Diana and a few others over to Italy to start the work there. It was, uh, we were first based before Assisi up in the north near Lake Como. And it, the first winter there, I think we can collectively uh, admit was probably the hardest year of our life, the hardest time of our life. It, I won't go into details, but we didn't speak the language. We didn't have any money. We were staying in a building that had no heat. We had very little food, and yet we were joyful because we were accepting and doing the tapasya. And then Swamiji came back in the spring. He was there in the fall, and then he left to do other things in the winter because we had to do the tapasya. And then when he came back, we never complained. We never said anything. But uh, Swami knew, and he looked at us, and he said, it was a hard time, wasn't it? And we said, yes, Swamiji. And he said, remember, nothing is accomplished without someone doing the tapasya. And remember that. And it's the same thing in our spiritual life. The life of, of a disciple is not an easy life. It's a life of tapasya. Because you have to do the work. You have to create the habit of meditation. You have to break down materialistic tendencies in yourself. You have to overcome the ego. You have to give up the reactive process. I remember once when our son was little, someone had teased him and he came home from school and he was crying and Jyotish, the sage, wise, always calm, pillar of my life, he, uh, he was saying to our son, now, you know, when someone teases you, you shouldn't react. You should be nice in return. And our little son was about four, and he said, Daddy, I don't want to be that kind of person. <laughs> I don't want to do the tapasya. <laughs> but now he's learned more. Now he, some 40 years later. But remember that. Nothing is accomplished finding God or building communities without someone's tapasya. And then the next quality is living in superconsciousness. And what does that mean? It means always finding the positive, always looking for solutions, never being deterred by whatever obstacles come in your way. This is the superconscious living. Master did it. Remember when he went to Mount Washington and he said, this is ours, and we're going to have our Sunday service here, Easter service. And they said, but, but sir, we don't own it yet. <laughs> and he said, no matter. We will do it. 
and Swami was always, to use a phrase, blowing our minds, just saying, make it bigger, make it better. And whatever obstacles would come, I remember uh, when the fire came, we were burnt to the ground, nothing left but ashes. But phoenix-like, we rose again. And how? Because we saw the, the possibilities. Someone re a few years ago gave us a, a cassette recording of the meeting that we had after the fire with Swami. We had no insurance. We had no homes. We had no money. We, uh, as <laughs> Durga called her mother, and her mother said, well, what do you have left? And she said, Mom, think of a handful of ashes. That's what we have left. So, but what did Swami do at that meeting? It was so thrilling to me to listen to his voice because it was so calm, so centered, like as though nothing had happened. He said, okay, well, how are we gonna uh, you know, earn money? And people said, well, we'll go out and plant trees for the Forest Service. We'll go to the city and earn money to, as jobs. We'll do this, we'll do that. Where are we gonna live? We'll, we'll uh, all the different possibilities. And it was though, okay, we have a game plan. We can go on. And I remember also another time, some of you know this story, but I just got it on a deeper level and I thought I should share it. We were driving up with Swamiji in a car to Lake Tahoe, which is a nearby ski area. In those days, Swami loved to ski. So we were driving and we, uh, it started to snow as we went over the mountain pass, the high pass, and the snow was coming down harder and harder. Swamiji was driving. And he, then the, they started posting signs, stop and put chains on your car. And so Swami hit the brakes, but we went into a terrible skid and we just were spinning and spitting and spitting. And we crashed into a Greyhound bus on the side of the road, parked. And our car was pretty much totaled. Luckily, no one was hurt. But what did Swami do? He got out of the car, looked up at the bus, and said, oh, it's going to the ski resort we were going to. Let's get on the bus. But I just got it this morning, actually. When you hit a bus, see where it's going. And if it's going in your, the direction, even maybe it's not where you thought you were going, but get on the bus. And that's the story of Ananda. Many buses all along the way that we crashed into, but we found they were going in our direction. When Swami wanted to write his magnificent essence of the Bhagavad Gita, based on master's commentaries. As we'll see tomorrow night in the movie, many of us have seen the movie, master had him editing with him, but, and he knew what was in there. He read it over and over, but when he wanted to write the commentaries, he didn't have a copy of the manuscript. And he said, master, I want to, she prayed, I want to do this for you, but how, I can't do it without a manuscript. And then he had a dream, and Master said, don't forget about a skylight, meaning it will come. And Swami said when he began working, he remembered shloka by shloka, verse by verse, exactly what Swamiji had said. And he wrote that magnificent book. And some of us now in India are creating an institute based on disseminating those teachings from the essence of the Bhagavad Gita. So living super consciously, and also as applies to our seeking God. Seeking God is not a mechanical process. You can't just, okay, here's the techniques, A, B, C, I've taken this course, and seeking God is a super conscious effort where you have to draw all the time inner guidance. How do I deepen my meditation? How do I make my kriyas more inward and more uh, being able to really raise the energy? How do I know what my guru wants me to do? Does he want me to say this? Does he want me to do this? Seeking God is a moment by moment experience in trying to channel higher consciousness. 
And the more we can understand that, the more we will evolve quickly. So then the next step, we've talked about receiving the vision, doing the tapasya, living super consciously. And now the next stage is to living and supporting each other, to understand that we can't do this alone, to create this community. When we were sent out to all the various places, Swami always sent us, excuse me, a small core of people because he knew we had to do it together. We had to support each other to create these communities. And for example, after the fire, it was such a, uh, sincerely, it was one of the most wonderful experiences because we stood here and we said, God, you took it all, but here we are. I remember in that, the day of the fire, it was an interesting day to say the least. It was like a war zone. It was nothing but smoke and ashes, big bomber planes going over, dropping flame retardant, and uh, amazing a day. But then at a certain point, I reconnected with Jyotish and Seva. And um, I was trying to be as brave as I could. And I said to them, well, where are we going to build the next community? And they looked at me like, what's wrong with her? <laughs> and, and they said, what do you mean? We'll build it right here. And I looked at the ashes and the burning tree stumps. But together we did it. Many hands make a miracle. And the same with our, and Swami, you know, one of the, th he said this years ago, and it took me a long time to accept it. He said, you all thank me for teaching, but I need you as much as you need me. I need receptive students, otherwise I couldn't teach. And it took me a long time to accept that because you put him up on a pedestal, he doesn't need us and so forth. But it wasn't that he needed us, but it was fulfilling as we saw in that beautiful video of Swami last night when he said the most fulfilling thing in my life is seeing the spirit in all of you. And so to, we need that and we need it to grow spiritually. We need to, I know I couldn't have kept on the path if I didn't have the example and the support and the love of my guru bhais. I remember early days, maybe I'd been here three years and we were sitting on Thursdays in those days up at the meditation retreat. It would be a day of silence and fasting. And it was Thursday morning. Um, and I was sitting in the temple and someone came and tapped me on the shoulder because in those days we had one phone and it was down at the village office. And so we had received word that my father had passed away and someone came up and got me and we arranged a ride, but everyone was in silence. And I remember going into the dining room where people were taking tea and water to, because food wasn't served. And I couldn't say anything to anyone because they were all in silence, but I just, they had all come out of meditation and I just stood there and I felt their consciousness and I felt their support not to me personally, but just the spiritual family. And I felt their profound rootedness in God. And I, I didn't need words. I didn't need someone to say, oh, you'll be all right. I just needed to be in their vibration. And I know all of you who are part of communities or meditation groups, you know what I'm talking about. And then I went home and was home for several weeks helping my mother sort things out. And I felt sustained that whole time by the presence of my guru bhais. So to find God, we need each other. To stay centered on this path, we need each other as much as we need everything else in our lives. And this is one of the big components that Christ says, where two or more are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Well, Master said he loved, he preferred a soul to a crowd, but he loved crowds of souls. And that's what communities are. They're crowds of souls. So supporting each other. And then summoning 
the endurance and willpower to keep going. It's easy to start, but it's easy to start meditating. I remember one Stratish and I were teaching when we were at the ashram in San Francisco, we were teaching a how to meditate class at a local church. And I was outside signing people up and he was inside greeting people. And these two women walked by, kind of uh, society looking women. And they said, oh, what's this class? And I said, well, this is how to meditate. And they said, oh, meditation, we already did that. <laughs> and, and I really had to just cover my mouth not to say, I don't think so. <laughs> but to have the endurance to keep going and to keep building things. And this again, Swami demonstrated as the years went by, did he ever say, well, you know, I think I've done enough. I think I'll just sit back now. You know, writing constantly, new books, new books. And every book he wrote, he said, you know, I think this is going to be a bestseller. <laughs> and one time Dharmadas asked him, on behalf of all of us, Swamiji, do you really think it's going to be a bestseller? And Swami said, correct me if I misquote, because I wasn't there. Swamiji said, no, but I have to think that way in order to keep producing all these books. And so just that constant outstream. Then, 2003, Swami's 77 years old. He's created communities all over America, all over the West Coast, groups, written many, many books. We get a letter at the Sangha office here from a couple in India, Westerners, but living in India for some time. And they said, Master's teachings are not being spread here. Swami was in Assisi at the time. They're not reaching people. And Devarshi, who was living a part of the staff at that time, uh, he brought the letter to us and he said, well, what do you think? Should we show this to Swamiji? Oh, I don't know, I don't know. But we forwarded it to him, sent it. Immediately he wrote back, we are starting a work in India. <laughs> At 77, and by George, he did. And, and he, just for a moment, everyone from India, please stand again, just to see. And this is, I won't say the cream of the crop, but this is the people that could afford to come and had the ability to do so. There are many, many more. And so he, at that point in his life, he kept going and going, no matter what happened, with all these principles, tapasya, and a, with the vision, and super conscious solutions, always applying these things. And similarly, what we've tried to do in his, since his leaving the body in 2013, this temple is a symbol. When we first began talking about it, honestly, people said, oh, we couldn't afford to do this. We don't have the money. Well, we are within a few hundred thousand of paying this whole thing off now. It's been incredible. And people said, oh, it's going to be so much work and all these things. And yet there was a core of us that said, we, and, and it was a super conscious thing, because we knew we needed to build it now. If we miss the moment, just like Sri Teshwar said to Master, the time is now. And we knew we had to build this temple now. And here it is, summoning up the endurance, the steadfast energy, and my friends, any of you who have been on the spiritual path for any bit of time understand this is the secret of finding God. It's not, oh, well, I did, I had a long meditation a year ago. It's every, <laughs> every day finding the energy, challenging yourself, 
finding the way to keep going, to find the inspiration, because the world will try to catch you in a million ways. Oh, this is important, and this is right, and this is an important cause, and all that. Our job is to find God, and we have to put that first and foremost, no matter what. And then finally, we've talked about all these different qualities, but the final one, and probably the most important, is receiving the grace and the blessings of God and Guru. And this, both in building these communities, the miracles that have taken place. You know, I, one of my favorite lines in the Bible is at the end of St. John, where he says, and if all the stories of the life of Christ were told, I suppose all the books in the world could not contain them. I love that line. And also, if all the miracles involved, the grace, the blessings, the disasters averted, the catastrophes overcome, if they were all chronicled, it would fill many, many books, always by the grace of God. You know, when there was a very fine and high soul, Swami Shankarananda, who has a Kriya Yoga temple up in Rishikesh. He's of our, he's a disciple of a disciple of Sri Teshwar, but he visited here. And in fact, he gave us a yantra, a on copper, a spiritual uh, geographic pattern. He said, this is for when you build your new temple. We didn't have any plans to build a temple then. And it is buried under the foundation of this temple. But when Swami Shankarananda came, Swamiji was still alive, but in India, and he wasn't here at the time, and we were showing him around, and he kept shaking his head, and he said, how did Swamiji do all this? How did Swamiji do all this? And then he said, oh, I understand. He didn't do it. God did it. And Swami was always aware of that, and that's why it succeeded. Because it wasn't, I will do this, God will do it. And that's why it succeeded, first and foremost. And the same in our search for God. If we think we can storm the gates of heaven with our willpower, we may get up to the gates of heaven, but the doors won't open. What opens the door is the grace of God. And so the story of these 50 years, it begins with receiving the vision, and it ends with receiving the grace. And, it, and those are the two most important things, receiving the vision to find God in our lives and to build communities, and then also to draw and receive the grace so that we can fulfill the mission of the masters because ultimately their highest mission is for us to come home, for our souls to break free of delusion and to find our spiritual home in God. These communities are reflections. Many people have commented, and I have felt it too, feels like the astral world here. And this is just a dim reflection of where we're going and these 50 years that we've experienced have shown us the tools and the spirit and the attitude that has created these places that will enable this movement to continue to grow and spread and that will enable all of us to find God. And so to close, I would like to ask you all to stand. <clears throat> and let's chant Om together and send out the vision that has created this way of life and this path to God that people everywhere can awaken from their slumbers of delusion and begin to direct their life towards God. Oh.
Thank you all.